Thanks so much for joining our uh, annual support fund, general information, and paths to success webinar. Uh, I'm Carrie Robison. I'm deputy commissioner for sponsor programs at the Board of Regents, and I have been working with the support fund since 2001, and I have been deputy commissioner since 2015. So. Uh, I have long experience with this program. I'm excited to talk to you about it today. Uh, it's a unique program to Louisiana. Often what we hear from our external consultants, our out-of-state consultants is, how did you get a program like this? Uh, I wish we had a program like this. We, most states do not have anything like this. It is, it is an exceptional program, and we are delighted to be talking with you about it today. Uh, for those of you for whom this information will be new, uh, welcome to the team. We are happy to support you in any way that we can. I'll be providing you with information on how to get in touch with us later in the presentation. Uh, for those of you who are joining for the umpteenth time, I apologize for the repetition that you'll hear today, but we will provide a very brief presentation, well, about a 30 minute presentation and leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, we'll also record this webinar and post it on our website. So if you know anyone who would like this information, please feel free to share it. It will be publicly available. All right, next slide, please. So we'll start with the basics. What is the Board of Regents Support Fund? The Board of Regents Support Fund is established in the Louisiana Constitution. Uh, Article 7, Section 10.1, the support fund was created in 1986. The money in the support fund comes from a trust fund that is held by the Louisiana State Treasury, and that trust fund is entirely dedicated to education. It generates revenues, and those revenues can be used uh, by the Board of Regents for higher education initiatives and by the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, or BESI, for K-12 initiatives. It's important to note that these are public dollars. So these are generated off the trust fund, which was established with an oil and gas settlement received by the state in the mid 1980s. These are public dollars, uh, which means that all of our activities have to have a public utility. They have to serve a public need and all of our processes are public, which means if you submit something to us that is discoverable, that is something that is, becomes a public document that we are obliged to share. Uh, constitutionally mandated goals for the trust fund. The trust fund is not just in the constitution as a pot of money. It is also, it also charges us to meet certain goals. And the two goals writ large that the support fund is charged to meet are improving the quality of higher education and enhancing Louisiana's economic development. We are charged to do this through four constitutionally designated designated programs. These are the only four areas in which we are allowed to expend dollars per the Constitution. Endowed chairs, remnant scholars, the enhancement of academic research and agricultural departments and units, targeted research and development at higher education institutions, and recruitment of superior graduate students. I want to return to enhancement of academic research and agricultural departments and units for a second. This is our broadest based program, as we'll discuss in a minute. But that language is in the Constitution, academic research and agricultural. And the reason it's there is to say that we do not provide support for um, anything like uh, regular administration, general institutional costs, uh, sports and recreation. All of those things are not eligible within the support fund. We can only provide funds for academic research and agricultural uses. Next slide, please. So how do we expend the funds that we are given? Uh, we expend them in two different ways. Grants, which are direct support. So about 70% of all the dollars that we have received from the trust fund uh, are provided in direct support, in direct grant support. These support educational and scholarly work, research and development work, departmental enhancement, graduate fellowships, uh, which is a program we no longer offer, and federal matching. These monies go to the institutions and are directly expended by the institutions within a contract period. We also provide matching for endowments. 
about 30% of all the dollars that we've expended since 1987. Uh, that is about a billion dollars that we have expended so far, $976 million. About 30% of that has been provided in matching funds that establish restricted permanent accounts that generate income. So the endowment funds that we provide are permanently restricted, but those funds are invested and generate income. Uh, for the activities that are designated by both regions, we set we have programs that set parameters, uh, but also by the donors who provide the non-state contribution to which support fund dollars are matched. Next slide. So what does this look like in terms of how we fund programs? We think about this as a pyramid. So we have a strong base of support, which is enhancement. That is where the broadest scope of projects are eligible. Uh, so we have departmental enhancement. I'll talk more about these programs as we go through. We have uh, our granting program, which is departmental enhancement. We also provide federal match to statewide, uh, mostly R&D programs uh, that, are, that are provided by National Science Foundation, NASA Department of Energy, uh, National Institutes of Health, and others. Uh, we also have several of our endowment programs in the enhancement area. If you look, the endowment programs are in red and the, uh, the granting programs are not in red. Uh, the, next, the next frame up on the pyramid is research and development, which uh, is broad-based research support for faculty who are pursuing various kinds of research activities. Research competitiveness uh, is the, the the biggest program that we offer, and it is intended to help our faculty become competitive for federal and other non-state dollars. Industrial ties are to build partnerships with uh, local, regional, and national business and industry. And our ATLAS program is for arts, humanities, and social sciences. And then the top two tiers of the pyramid are endowment programs, uh, recruitment of superior graduate students, through it, which we support now through endowed graduate student scholarships and our flagship endowed chairs program, which provides million dollar plus chairs uh, for superior senior faculty who will be game changing in the state of Louisiana. Next slide. So what do we do in terms of grant programs? This is where most of the interest on this call is going to be. While I launch into this, I'll say if you have questions, please submit them in the chat. So that, and we'll, we have someone in the room who can read out your questions and I will stop at the end of the general uh, overview of the support fund and take some questions and then we'll go through how to succeed in our programs and the remainder of the time will be uh, taken up with your questions. Next slide. So in general, the support fund <clears throat> is eligible, or any institution is eligible for the support fund who meets these criteria. If you're a public post-secondary education campus, you're eligible. So that's every, every campus at every level, from uh, two-year uh, community and technical colleges to four-year doctoral granting institutions, all public post-secondary education campuses are eligible. Also eligible are private campuses that are members of the Louisiana Association of Independent Colleges and Universities. This is stipulated in the Constitution that only private campuses that are members of LAKU are allowed to participate in the support fund. The support fund supports all academic and workforce disciplines. So as I said, academic research and agricultural, that's our limitation, but within that limitation, all academic and workforce disciplines are eligible for our programs. However, each sub-program is going to have different restrictions, some will have discipline rotations, some will be restricted to STEM disciplines, some will be restricted to other kinds of, of programs. So check the RFP to determine the restrictions in individual programs. Most of our grant projects require faculty leadership. Everything that is submitted to us, however, is submitted through the Office of Sponsored Programs at your institution or its equivalent. Nothing is submitted directly from a faculty member to the Board of Regents. So as you are preparing proposals for submission, make sure you know what your Office of Sponsored Programs or whatever entity on your campus is submitting proposals. 
how they are, are running the proposal submission on their end. Make sure you give yourself enough time to go through whatever their processes are in order to get that proposal submitted by the deadline. Um, our deadlines are absolute, so it doesn't matter if you submit a proposal at the last second to your OSP and your OSP doesn't have time to submit it forward, it's not submitted. Uh, endowments are submitted by the institution only and have different pre and post award requirements. We'll talk a little bit about endowments, but, but generally we won't talk much. If you need to know more about endowments, there's lots of information on the website, or you can always contact me or the program administrator. Finally, as I mentioned before, our funding is public. Everything that we do is subject to disclosure. Uh, most documentation submitted to the regents, including proposals, is public record. There is an advantage to this to anyone who is considering applying to a support fund program, and the advantage is that you can request sample proposal copies be sent to you so you can have an idea of what a successful proposal submitted in the past and funded in the past looks like. There is a process for doing that on our website, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the different programs that faculty can apply for in the support fund. Uh, the first and the broadest base program is departmental enhancement. The program goal uh, for departmental enhancement is very simple. It's to en uh, enhance the capacity and quality of high priority departments and academic units across all of our institutions. Uh, we say enhance because the purpose of the support fund is not to provide operating dollars or dollars for, for basic support. It is to provide enhancing dollars that build capacity and quality. All academic disciplines are eligible in departmental enhancement. We do have an, a discipline rotation, one year on, one year off. So if you missed out this year, don't worry, you're eligible next year. Targeted workforce, however, by which we mean uh, workforce programs that don't fall within one of the academic disciplines, so something like, like uh, industrial welding, those are eligible every year because of the demand in our workforce in Louisiana for graduates of those programs. We have two different grant types within departmental enhancement. The first is comprehensive. These are large scale awards up to five years, up to a million dollars total across those five years that will move the unit comprehensively or mar markedly toward a strategic goal. So if your department knows where it's headed, and knows how it wants to move over the next five years, you can get a very large award to accomplish, to help accomplish that work. However, these are supposed to be comprehensive in scope. So only one proposal per academic research or agricultural unit is permitted uh, in a competition cycle. We also have targeted awards. For those of you who might've been around for a while, the targeted awards are very similar to the previous departmental or uh, uh, traditional enhancement awards. They're smaller scale awards. They provide one year of funding up to $200,000, no limit on proposals per unit. So a unit can submit as many as the unit wishes to, to provide a focused enhancement. Say you need to purchase a piece of equipment. You have a one year rollout of curricular enhancements. There's some faculty training that you want to contract out to do. Those are the kinds of things you can do through targeted enhancement. While there is no limit on the, the number of proposals that uh, a, a unit can submit, there is a required ranking of the proposal submitted by a single unit. So if a unit submits four proposals, that unit will have to rank those proposals in order of their importance, their contribution to the unit. The reason that we do this is our, exter our consultants are all external. They're all out of state. They often don't know the landscape in Louisiana. They want to know what the department envisions as the most important things that it's doing when they look at these enhancement awards. Next slide, please. What kinds of things can you do with a departmental enhancement grant? You can do all kinds of things. Basically, anything that will enhance uh, the academic offerings of your department is eligible. You can, the most common thing that we do is non-capital infrastructure enhancement. This is basically equipment purchases. 
You can buy tools that will create or expand your capacity. You can also uh, make requests for tools that are an advancement over something you currently have or that replace defunct pieces of equipment. You can look at new frontiers. How are you going to pilot and, and implement new initiatives that departments thinking of going in a new direction? So you can, you can submit requests for funding for that. You can advance or change directions of work you already have in progress. You want to move in a new direction. You need uh, new material to, to take on a different aspect of the work you're already doing. You can look at faculty development to learn new skills, learn new approaches, uh, learn new curricula. Uh, you can do all those kinds of things with departmental enhancement. There are some things that you cannot do or we don't encourage you to do. We cannot provide additional compensation for any faculty member, even if you're working Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, uh, we cannot, uh, evenings, we cannot provide any additional compensation. Any compensation that's provided through a support fund award has to be provided as release from the institution. Uh, that includes training. If you want to train faculty to do something, you cannot hire your own faculty to provide that training and give them a stipend or a supplement to do that. You, the only way you can provide a stipend or a supplement is if you hire someone from out of state to come in and provide that training. We don't allow any funding for capital expenses. So if you need to repair air conditioning systems in your building, there's nothing we can do to help you through the support fund. We do not provide funding for standard operating. We can't supplant existing resources. If you paid for something last year, uh, we can't, you can't then shift that to uh, the support fund so that you can save money for other activities, which include restoring budget cuts. That's more important this year than it has been in the last few years because we are looking at the possibility that higher ed will take a reduction in in the next fiscal year next slide please so what did it look like in the departmental enhancement competition last year we received 101 proposals we funded 24 so we have about a we have about a 25 percent success rate a little bit lower the success rate is lower and comprehensive because these are very large awards that obligate us for multiple years. So we, we fund fewer of those. It's a little bit better in targeted enhancement and we spent about $3.3 million. So that gives you an idea of what the competition looks like. Next slide, please. We'll move on to our R&D programs. We have four R&D programs. Uh, we have our RCS program. It is our largest, uh, it gets about $1.3 million per year for new awards. And these are all one to three year awards to help faculty who are near competitiveness for federal research dollars overcome the barriers to competitiveness and secure federal funding. RCS is a great program. It's very similar to a, uh, an EPSCoR style program. We will provide up to $200,000 for multi-year awards and up to $20,000 for a one-year award. The purpose of all these awards though is to help faculty overcome the barriers and be competitive for federal funding. That means if you're already competitive, you're not really eligible for these dollars. It means that there has to be a source of federal funding to which you would apply. So if the federal funding agencies are interested in the kind of research you do, you will struggle to be successful in this program. Uh, it also means that at the end of, of your award period, whether that's one year, two years, or three years, we expect you to have overcome your barriers. That means we need to understand what your barriers are, uh, whether you know for sure because you've gotten feedback from a federal agency or you're not sure. Um, you need to identify those barriers in the proposal. We expect you at the end of the, of the funding cycle to be competitive. So this is not a renewable thing. It's not something that you do for three years and then you reapply and you get more funding. This is really a graduation style program. Uh, our industrial ties, these are one to three year awards for research projects with industry contribution and the potential for development and diversification, diversification of Louisiana's economy, $250,000 total with annual caps. 
Uh, and then a proof of concept and prototyping. These are one year awards to uh, support projects with near term commercialization and tech transfer potential uh, to get there. So marketing plans, proof of concept, construction, all those kinds of things are eligible in POCP. Again, though, like RCS, like ITRS, you have to show that there's a market for what it is you're planning to produce. And finally, ATLAS, these are one-year awards for completion of major projects in arts, humanities, and social sciences disciplines. Everything that we do is based on the discipline of the project that is submitted and not the discipline in which the faculty submitter is housed. That means if you're a biologist and you're working on a play, you are eligible to submit an ATLAS for your play. It doesn't matter that you're a biologist by training. And that's true throughout the R&D programs. Next slide, please. So what do these programs look like? They're very similar right now. They're very similar. They used to be much more competitive than the enhancement programs. But as our funding has shifted, they've become just about uh, on target with the, uh, the enhancement projects. So it's about a 25% success rate. We received 207 proposals, we funded 52. We spent about two and a half million dollars. That will decline a little bit this year because our funding has declined a little bit. Uh, the trust fund is generating less money. Next slide, please. Endowment programs, I'll go through this very quickly. These are just indirect support for campuses uh, to support faculty and students. Next slide. We do four endowment programs, the endowed chairs, which are the large million dollar senior faculty uh, chairs, endowed professorships, which are $100,000 minimum for faculty of, that can be awarded to faculty of any rank. Uh, we also provide matching for endowed scholarships for first generation undergraduate students. These are again, $100,000 or $50,000 at the two year campus level uh, to support to provide small stipends and support for first generation students who are coming into our undergraduate programs. We provide a $100,000 minimum superior graduate student scholarships to support graduate students in our highest need, highest impact programs. And we provide uh, very uh, small endowments, uh, $20,000 minimum endowments for workforce scholarships at our two year uh, institutions. Deadlines for submission, these are very important because our programs, all of our deadlines are absolute. We cannot make changes. Our RFPs, our requests for proposals, have the effect of law, which means everyone plays by the same rules, which means everyone gets the same deadline. Uh, the only time we can ever change a deadline is when there is an external factor that requires a deadline change for everyone. Something like a knock on wood, we don't get any of these this year. A major hurricane comes through the state. It affects a large population of people. In that instance, it's an external factor, and we can issue a, uh, an addendum to the RFP to change the deadline. Otherwise, we cannot change deadlines. There's no point in even asking. So for competitive endowments, all of those programs are due February 1st, 2025. Departmental Enhancement is our earliest competitive grant program. It's due October 24th. Uh, r and these are these are all flexible that are these are all deadlines that are a little bit different. So for RCS, ITRS, and POCP, there's a mandatory notice of intent that's due September 11th. So next week, the full proposal for RCS is due November 7th. The full proposal for RT, ITRS and POCP is due on Halloween, October 31st. And for Atlas, the mandatory notice of intent is due October 14th, and the full proposal November 21st. Next slide, please. All right, I don't see any questions yet in the chat, so I will continue on to succeeding in support fund competitions. Next slide. So our competitions are highly competitive. We have a success rate that's roughly equivalent to the federal success rate at about 25%. NSF's a little bit higher at 27%. That's their latest data. So you have to look at these presentations at, or at, at these proposals as 
something that you have a, a one in four chance of getting funding for. So it's very important that you take the process seriously, that you understand what it is that the support fund is looking for from each of its programs, what it is that our, our projects, uh, we expect our projects to accomplish so that you can position yourself in the best way to win an award. So the best thing uh, that I can tell you to do is be persistent. Apply early and often, learn from experience, listen to reviewer comments even when you disagree. We provide debriefing on every competitive project that is submitted to us. You will get reviewer comments, you'll get it in July uh, of the year after you submitted. So we will release uh, results of our competitions in April. We'll go through the process of contracting with the winners and then in July we will release the reviewer comments to you. A lot of people don't like to hear negative comments. They don't like to see criticism, but it's very important to look at the comments and see if you can understand where the reviewers are coming from, even when you disagree, because the reviewers don't know you and they don't know your project and they're looking simply at the words on the page. So make sure that you look at that and try to see where, how you can improve your project, how you can better explain things, better position your argument and learn from your experience. You can't win if you don't play. So being discouraged at not winning a one in four chance doesn't serve you well. It is always better to persist and keep applying and learn from your experience. Uh, second important thing, awareness. You don't know, if you don't know what's out there, you can't apply for it. So know what opportunities are out there. Also know how the competitive programs work. So that's why I gave you all the information about how competitive are they? How do you get proposal copies? Those kinds of things so that you can sort of know how our, comp our competitions work and what your chances are. How competitive do you need to be? And finally, if you look at an RFP and something doesn't make sense to you, ask us. The program managers at the Board of Regents are available to you always until October 15th. That's our, our Q&A deadline, which we have to set to make sure everybody gets equal information. But you can call us, you can email us, you can sign up for sessions. I'll talk about that in a minute, but make sure that you ask your questions. It's always better to ask your question uh, than to be wondering or make a wrong assumption. Third, obedience. We have rules, our RFPs are 10 to 14 pages long. Those are where, that's where the rules are. It's a very important that you follow the rules because that's what the reviewers are gonna be looking at. They're gonna be looking at what are our goals? What are we looking for? What did we ask you to do? What order did we ask you to put it in? If you don't follow the rules, they often don't know where to find things or will score you down because they don't see the information that they need. And finally, empathy. Understand what every party to the transaction wants and needs. Next slide, please. What do I mean by that? There needs to be balance among the elements. So every proposal author should start with, what do I need from this project? That's the stakeholder needs and benefits. What do I need? What am I gonna get out of it if I get funded? That's, that's critically important as you start envisioning your project. However, it's also important to think about what does your campus need? This is a campus-based award. So how does this fit with what it is that your campus is prioritizing? How does it fit with what it is your campus wants you to do as a faculty member, wants you to accomplish as a faculty member, what it's prioritizing and what's, what it sees as its greatest opportunities? Making sure you explain that context is really important, especially for reviewers who aren't positioned to know that context intimately. They are not from here, they do not work here, so they don't know your context. So making sure that you put your project within your context is important. And finally, we're a stakeholder in all of these projects. The funding agency, in this case, the Board of Regents through the Board of Regents Support Fund, we have priorities and we have objectives and those are embodied in the RFP. So reading the RFP, understanding what the goals of our, pro our, our programs are, what it is that we're looking for them to accomplish is critically important. I say this because one of the most common things that we see faculty members doing in unsuccessful proposals 
is saying, I know that this program is for something that I'm not really aligned with. Like the RCS program is for faculty who are on the cusp of competitiveness for federal dollars. I don't really fit that <clears throat> because I already have a bunch of federal dollars, but my idea is so good that the, the uh, reviewers are going to overlook that and just allow me to submit anyway and allow me to be successful anyway. That never works out. You have to know what it is that we're trying to accomplish with these programs and respect that in your applications. Next slide, please. So what does a good proposal work, uh, look like? Uh, before you have to look, you have to think about a proposal in three time scales. So you have to think about before funding. So where are you now? How is your idea aligned with the department or the unit strategic priorities, the campus role, scope, and mission, the goals of the funding source? And you also have to document and support your arguments for needed value. So where you are today, how will this launch you forward? What is the need for what, what you're proposing? And what's the value if you actually accomplish it? You have to look at during the project, this is the work plan. How are you going to do the work that you're proposing to do? How will it proceed? What's your timeline? What's the impact during the lifetime of the grant? What's the impact after the grant? And what will success look like? If I, as a program manager, am looking at your final report, how would I know that you accomplished what it is that you set out to accomplish? And you also have to think after the project. So what are the consequences of project completion? Once it's done, what will the landscape look like that is different from what it looks like today? You also, in most cases, need to present a plan for post-award sustainability. What this means is, if you're buying a big piece of equipment through departmental enhancement, how will it be maintained to maximize its use? We do not allow any funding for maintenance through the support fund, even during the lifetime of the grant. We do not allow any charges to us to provide basically what the institution should be providing, which is ensuring that everything remains operational and useful throughout its lifetime. So what we need to see in a grant or when, in a grant application is concrete, realistic, and detailed plans to make sure that any activities that need to be sustained beyond the lifetime can be sustained. And it's not a, a concrete, realistic, or detailed plan to say that we're going to continue to apply to the support fund to sustain our operations. That is not something that's allowed within the support fund, and it's also not a reliable or realistic plan that you will win cycle after cycle. Next slide, please. Writing for external reviewers, it's very important to remember that all of our reviewers are out of state. Every one of them is not within Louisiana. Some of them might have worked in Louisiana in the dark mists of time, but they have not worked here in at least five years. So making sure that when you're writing, you're stepping out of yourself and you're showing them very specific things, like you are aware of the program goal, the program guidelines, and the scoring rubric. Every RFP has a scoring rubric in the appendices. Make sure you know what it is they're being asked to score and how it's weighted. Uh, strong arguments that are rooted in the purposes, goals, and objectives of the funding. So everything should reflect what the RFP is asking you to do. They're going to be looking for that. Uh, explain any context. I've already talked about this, but explain any context and priorities that you think an external evaluator needs to know. Make sure you demonstrate knowledge of state of the art in the subject area and how your project fits or advances it. One of the big mistakes that we see in proposals is people applying to purchase funding for uh, equipment that is out of date or not the state of the art. If you're going to do that, you are, at, you are able to do that, but you need to make sure that you're explaining why this is the right move for your department at the right time, that you know what the state of the art is, and this is a deliberate choice on your part. And all significant data, make sure you provide data where it's, where it's available, where it's applicable. All of that data needs to be presented in the appropriate context so that the reviewers can understand what the data means and how it speaks to your argument. And the data needs to support 
the need, impact, and long-term value of the investment. This is an investment of money. These are public dollars, and we need to see, and reviewers are asked to look at what value we get, what return on investment we get for the investment of these dollars. Next slide, please. So if I had to boil all this down, how do you win in the support fund? This is the most common question we get. How do I make sure that I can win this money? Because it's a lot of effort and we understand that. Make sure you're showing clear and meaningful alignment with the RFP and with campus and unit priorities. Make sure that we can see that you know what we need and you know what your institution needs. Emphasize need, impact, quality, and sustainability. I can't emphasize this enough. Make sure that we know what you need, why you need it, how it's going to impact your, your program, how it's going to boost quality. Remember the two goals of the support fund. Increase the quality of higher education in Louisiana and support economic development of the state. So we need to be able to see what's the quality outcome of this project and sustainability. If your project is going to take longer than three to five years, most of them do. If it's intended to last longer, an investment that will last longer than three to five years, then you need to be able to show plans for sustaining that project after the support fund dollars go away. And finally, anticipate questions, concerns, and challenges. My colleague, Brian Jones, who is our Senior Grants Programs Administrator, always says that evaluators, and he's worked in these programs for 22 years, so he has sat through many, many evaluation panels. They divide proposals into three stacks. The yes, these are great proposals. We definitely want to fund them. The no's, these don't speak to the goals of the program. These, these aren't well developed. It's, it's, they're not timely. And the maybes. The maybes are always, this could be a good project, but we have a question. This could be a good project, but we don't quite understand how this is going to work. This could be a good project, but we see some issues here that aren't addressed. You have to look at your, your project. You have to look at your proposal with that lens to say, what questions are they going to have? What concerns are they going to have? What challenges are they going to see? And anticipate those and answer them in the moment so that they never have a chance to put you in the maybe pile. Because that maybe pile will be the tallest stack we see, but it will also be the ones that aren't going to get the funding. So whether you need to pass it off to someone else and determine, have someone else who is a third party say, these are my questions, Here, here's what I see in your proposal. Whether you need to look at it critically yourself, that is entirely your decision, but make sure you've taken the time and given yourself enough space to anticipate those questions, concerns, and challenges. That's something that frustrates uh, program staff every year is we will get calls on deadline day at about 4.22 p.m. with our deadline at 4.30 p.m. and the system will close and lock you out if you are not finished by the deadline date and time. We will get calls and say, I just didn't have quite enough time to get everything done and get it to my OSP and get it into you. I just need a little extra time. Can you give me that grace? And we have to say, no, we cannot do that. So you need to build in enough time to write the proposal you want to write, to make it as competitive as you can, to get it to your office of sponsored programs or its equivalent in time for them to review it, make sure that it's good to go and send it forward to us by that deadline date and time. So the best advice I can give you is start early, read critically, develop all of your ideas as thoroughly as you need to develop them, make sure that they're aligned, and get everything in by that deadline date. Next slide, please. Post-award requirements. If you do win, what will that mean for you? That will mean we will issue a contract. That contract will be between the Board of Regents and the campus, and if it's a public institution, it's system. So we do not contract directly with individuals. If you are a researcher and you submit a research award, we're not gonna contract with you. You will be named 
as a party to the contract, but you will not be the contract holder. The contract holder will be your institution. We will require compliance with reviewer stipulations. So with funded projects, the reviewers will say, we approve this level of funding. So it may be the full amount requested. It may be a reduced amount. Whatever the reviewers uh, recommend is what the Board of Regents will consider for funding. They may also say, we recommend this level of funding, but no funding for, say, travel. At that point, travel is disallowed. No matter if you can save money somewhere else, no matter if you would rather have travel than something else, you want to cut something else out of your budget, at that point, it becomes a reviewer stipulation and you are not allowed to have anything that they stipulate you cannot have. Uh, match rates. If your institution provided match to the project in the proposal, that match must be at least maintained at, at the same proportion as the level of funding awarded. It may be required to be maintained at the full amount that's provided by the institution. Though that is non-negotiable. The institutional match may not be reduced, uh, particularly if a reviewer says that it can't be reduced. A uh, detailed budget and budget justification, you will have gone through this in the proposal. We will come back to you at the contracting stage and require that you put together the budget again, that it will be updated with the correct dollar amounts, with all the correct information and resubmitted as part of the contract. Uh, support fund payments are made in advance. So if you, if we, if you win the award and once we sign the contract, we will remit that payment to your institution. Multi-year projects, though, will have retainage. So we will pay in advance the amount, uh, the percentage that we allow to be paid in advance, and we will retain until the submission of the annual project report, and then, and then pay the retainage with the second year funding and so on. You will be required to submit annual and final project and financial reports, so this shouldn't catch you off guard that every year we have to hear from you, how's it going, what are you doing, what have your outcomes been so far? How much money have you spent and where? And any major changes to a project, including changes to the budget and changes to personnel, say the PI leaves and you need to replace the PI, generally these require board approval. So you'll have to send us a request and we will have to approve. This is all specified in the contract, which you will receive well before you agree to anything like this. Next slide. How do you get more information about our programs? Simple, it's all on the web. And all of those email addresses before you and I will be posting this presentation on the web along with the video link uh, on our website, which you see at the top of the page. Uh, these are the individuals that you would contact when you have questions about the programs. Next slide, please. We also have an online Q&A. You can go to our website, you can find the online Q&A, and we update it in real time throughout the Q&A period, which ends October 15th. So if you go to that, you can, you can select by program or by general questions, and you can read through all of those questions at your leisure. We also have Ask the Program, uh, session, ask the program Manager sessions. Uh, these are 10-minute discussion slots with our, our grants program manager. Uh, he will be happy to talk to you. You can go to our website to find uh, those discussion slot opportunities and to register for them. And finally, for staff assistance, if you need anything from anyone, you can always uh, go to our website or you can email uh, individual program, and program administrators. Next slide, please. Q&As. Technical issues, if you have technical issues with our website or other things, uh, with Logan Access, Logan is our online grants automation network, that's how you submit your proposal. If you have questions about that, oops, that, that okay. email address is out of date. It is rsi.laregion, at laregions.edu. And I will correct that in the slides that go up on the, on the uh, web. All right. Next slide, please. Do you have any questions? There have been no questions submitted uh, in the chat. If you have questions, please ask them now. If there are no questions, I can give you a little bit of time on your day back. 
All right. Someone has raised a hand. Carpet, can you unmute? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Megan Soth from Tulane University. I just wanted to share that the chat is actually disabled or it has been during, yes, it's still disabled. Okay, hang on, we'll get that fixed. Um, probably, can I just let them raise their hands and all? Yeah, okay, uh, our, our system is sorry. What was that? I said, sorry, yeah, um, we can't change it mid, but okay, raise so your hand. Raise, and we'll just raise your hand with questions. I'm sorry about that. Any questions? All right, I'll give you another couple of minutes. Please, this is not your only opportunity. I know people always worry about contacting program managers and they worry that we're not accessible. Trust me, we are. We're here uh, for the most part every single day. We do not work from home. We are available to talk to anyone who wants to ask us questions about our programs. We like to talk about our programs. We've been here a long time. We have a lot of expertise. So please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Uh, sign up for a session if you want a session with the program manager. But if the session you want is full, if there are no times available that meet your schedule, don't worry about it. Just give him a call uh, or give him or send him an email. All right, if there are no questions, thank you so much for attending. We appreciate your interest in the support fund. We look forward to working with you and don't hesitate to get in touch if you need anything from us during the competition cycle. Thank you. <laughs>